This news story was written by Teddy Amenabar. Advice for picky eaters, liking a variety of foods linked with brain health. Rather than focusing on specific diets, the scientists examined the link between the foods individuals liked and disliked and their cognitive health. Older people who aren't picky eaters appear to have better brain health than those who prefer more limited diets, according to a large study of British adults. The research tracked the dietary preferences of nearly 182,000 older adults in Britain. The study was unusual because rather than focusing on the health effects of a particular diet, it examined the link between the foods individuals liked and disliked and their mental well-being and cognitive health. After parsing the data, the researchers noticed a trend. People who liked a variety of foods and flavors reported better mental health and well-being, and did better on cognitive tests than those with limited dietary preferences. The findings suggest that preference for a limited diet, such as a vegetarian diet or a high-protein diet, may not always be best for overall well-being. Based on the results, people need a more balanced diet to be better off, said John Feng Feng, one of the study's lead researchers who works at both the Institute of Science and Technology for Brain-Inspired Intelligence at Fudan University in Shanghai and at the University of Warwick in Britain. Picky Eaters vs. Balanced Eaters To conduct the research, which was published in the journal Nature Mental Health, the scientists from Britain and China looked at food preferences among participants in the UK Biobank study, one of the largest and longest health research studies in the world. The UK Biobank volunteers completed a food-liking questionnaire, ranking their preferences for 140 foods and beverages. The rankings were measured on a nine-point hedonic scale, in which one represents extremely dislike and nine represents extremely like. The ranked foods fell into 10 categories, alcohol, beverages, dairy, flavorings, such as black pepper, curry, ketchup and vinegar, fruits, fish, meat, snacks, starches, and vegetables. The researchers found that 57% of respondents showed a balanced preference across all 10 food categories, while others were more picky. One group, 18%, preferred starch-free or reduced starch foods, another 5% preferred a vegetarian diet, while the last group, 19%, preferred eating more protein and less fiber. Some of the findings contradict conventional wisdom about healthy eating. For instance, individuals who preferred fruits and vegetables more than protein-rich foods, suggesting a more vegetarian diet, exhibited a heightened susceptibility to symptoms of anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental distress, said Wei Chung, a professor in the Institute of Science and Technology for Brain-Inspired Intelligence at Fudan University. Other participants who favored diets high in protein and low in fiber were also more likely to report symptoms of anxiety and diminished well-being, he said. It's important to note that the data only show an association with certain food preferences and mental health. For instance, it may be that people who prefer certain food groups have other characteristics that could affect mental health scores. A link between food and brain health the study adds to a growing body of research demonstrating the ways in which the food we eat may affect our brain health. High sugar, fatty diets, also known as a Western diet, have been associated with decreased cognitive performance. And a small study of Finnish men found a Western diet was associated with an increased prevalence of depressive symptoms. The Mediterranean diet, high in fruits, vegetables, fish, and olive oil, has been linked with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. The study's results demonstrate that specific food preferences have significant associations with mental health, cognitive functions, blood and metabolic biomarkers, and brain imaging. Rebecca McPherson, an associate professor at Brock University in Ontario, Canada, who studies how exercise and diet can improve a person's metabolism and brain health, said in an email. 
There is a clear need for more preclinical studies investigating the underlying mechanisms, as well as the short and long-term effects different nutrients can have on the progression of disease, said McPherson, who was not involved in the study. The observational study has several limitations, the researchers said. Ruohan Zhang, a doctorate student at the University of Warwick and the lead author, said the data is based on preference for various foods, not what an individual actually consumed day to day. Participants in the UK Biobank are known to be comparatively healthier than the general population. In the study, the researchers described a balanced diet as one that includes vegetables, fruits, cereals, nuts, seeds, pulses, moderate dairy, eggs, and fish. That's just a very, very healthy diet, said Thomas M. Holland, a physician scientist at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago who was not involved in the research. We know that diet impacts not only global cognition but a lot of different domains, being semantic memory, episodic memory, working memory, perceptual speed. You will hear an estate agent talking to a customer who wants to rent a house. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I'm interested in renting a house somewhere in the town. Right. Uh, could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Stephen Godfrey. And tell me how many bedrooms you're looking for. Well, we'd need four because I'm going to share the house with three friends. Okay. There are several of that size on our books. They mostly belong to families who are working abroad at the moment. What about the location? It'd be nice to be central. Oh, that might be difficult as most houses of that size are in the suburbs. Still, there are a few. What's your upper limit for the rent? We'd like something around £500 a month, but we could go up to £600 if we have to. But we can't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Do you know how long you want to rent the house for? The minimum let is six months, as you probably realise. We're at college here for two years, and we don't want to have to move during that time if we can avoid it. Right. And how soon do you want to move in? All our lets start on the first of the month. Well... As soon as possible, really. So that means September 1st. OK. Let me have a look at what we've got. Uh, we have photographs of all the houses on our book, so you can get an idea of what they're like. There's this one in Oakington Avenue at £550 a month, combined living room and dining room with a separate kitchen. It doesn't have a garage, though you can park in the road. Ah, uh, we'd prefer to have one if possible. Right. Then... Have a look at this house in Mead Street. Mm -hmm. It's got a very large living room and kitchen, bathroom, cloakroom. How much is it? That one's 580. It's very well furnished and equipped. It also has plenty of space for parking and it's available for a minimum of a year. Oh, and there's a big garden. I don't think we could cope with that, to be honest. We'll be too busy to look after it. Mm, OK. Uh, then there's this older house in Hamilton Road. Living room, kitchen, diner, and it has a study. Uh, 550 a month. That looks rather nice. But whereabouts in Hamilton Road? Towards the western end. Oh, that'll be very noisy. I know the area. Yes, it's pretty lively. But some people like it, though. Well, what about this house in Devon Close? That looks lovely. There's a big demand for houses in that area, so prices tend to be quite high. But this one hasn't been decorated for a few years, which has kept the rent down a bit. It's got a living room, dining room and small kitchen, and it's 595 a month. I think it would suit you from what you've said. Mm, it sounds fine. Why is that part of town so popular? Well, there's a big scheme to improve the district, and it'll soon have the best facilities for miles around. What sort of thing? There's a big sports centre under construction, which will be very impressive when it's finished. In fact, the swimming pool's already opened, ahead of schedule, and it's attracting a lot of people. What about cinemas? Are there any in the area? The only one closed down last year, and it's now in the process of being converted into a film museum. The local people are trying to get a new cinema added to the scheme. I think I heard something about a plan to replace the existing concert hall with a larger one. Ah, that's due to start next year. Ah. Well, it sounds an interesting area to live in. Mm.
Could I go and see the house, please? Yes, of course. Kasuo Ishiguro, who was born in Japan but grew up in England, is one of the most influential writers of fiction in English today. He has written nine books and won numerous prizes, including the Nobel Prize in Literature. His latest novel, Clara and the Sun, is set in a dystopian world and narrated by Clara, a solar powered robot who has the role of AF, standing for Artificial Friend, to a teenage girl called Josie. Clara uses her artificial intelligence to observe the people around her and learn as much as she can about human emotions. The empathy that Clara develops helps her provide friendship and care to Josie and her mother. This care is especially valuable because Josie is dangerously ill following an intervention to modify her genetic code and so increase her intelligence. Despite being a robot, Clara has quasi religious feelings. She believes that the sun, whose energy keeps her alive, will do the same for Josie. This latest novel by Ishiguro is a fascinating reflection on what it means to be human in an age of genetic modification and artificial intelligence. So, how does Clara and the Sun compare with Ishiguro's previous books? The author's first big success, The Remains of the Day, is set in England between the 1930s and 1950s and follows the life of a butler who works for an aristocrat in a traditional mansion. It was made into a film starring Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. On the surface, the remains of the day with its historical setting seems completely different from the futuristic sci fi scenario of Clara and the Sun. But in fact, the themes of service, sacrifice, and identifying what is valuable in life are quite similar. Another of Ishiguro's best known novels, Never Let Me Go, tells the story of three teenagers at an isolated boarding school in England. We slowly find out that the teenagers are clones and that when they reach adulthood, their organs will be harvested. The true horror of the novel is that the teenagers have no choice except to make the best of their short lives and accept their destiny. Again, there are clear parallels with Clara and the Sun. Clara devotes herself 100% to her teenager, Josie, and even makes a physical sacrifice for her. During a presentation of Clara and the Sun, Ishiguro spoke about how his writing has developed, some of the main themes of his work, and how literature might respond to the issues we face as a society. Despite the dystopian setting of Clara and the Sun, Ishiguro says there is hope and optimism to the story. As I've got older, perhaps I'm not more optimistic, but I, I want to celebrate what I think is good about human beings. And by and large, I am impressed by human beings. Of course, they do terrible things, they make many mistakes, but by and large, you know, there is something very admirable and noble about human beings. Particularly when they're trying to express love or devotion or protectiveness towards each other. And so, typically, recently, my books have become like that. People live in a harsh world, often in a system that they can't escape. Rebellion is almost unthought of because you can't even see a path to rebellion. But how they find some kind of hope, their own kind of small rebellion, is to create little、um, private worlds, almost like an oasis, in which they can exchange love and affection and decency towards each other. And that's what tends to happen in my more recent books, I think. Several of Ishiguro's novels, including Clara and the Sun, explore how some individuals, whether humans, clones, or robots, will spend their whole lives serving people who are more powerful than themselves. But this hierarchy of power is not only about class, but also touches on something more universal, says Ishiguro. All my life I've been on the left, but I don't think in my books I'm necessarily trying to write about the working classes as such. I'm trying to provide a more general metaphor, a universal metaphor for ordinary people of all classes. What I'm trying to say is that in our relationship to power, 
Most of us are like servants. If you just take one of those characters, like the butler in The Remains of the Day, he is like a metaphor. Uh, I'm not really looking at the servant class in, in Britain in a particular point of time. He's a metaphor for us all. And somebody like Kathy, who is the clone in Never Let Me Go, she's a victim of this very cruel system. In another way, she's like all of us. We are all caught in a cruel condition of mortality. We all have limited lives. And most of us have to face the fact that you know, we'll grow older and we'll become ill and we'll die. And we try to make something meaningful of our lives within the cruelty of that system. We try and find love and decency and good things to do that will give us some pride, despite this cruel framework that we live in. And so I'm not really trying to talk on behalf of the working class or anything like this. I'm trying to say something about the position that most of us are in, in our societies and in relationship to mortality. Looking back over a successful career and forward to the future, Ishiguru reflects on the future of literature in our fast-changing world. I'm of the older generation. I'm now 66 years old, and I'm looking to the younger generation of writers to find a voice for this world that is changing so much. To a large extent, I'm the product of the post-war era, and I see things in those terms. When I try and look at the present and certainly the future, I just see a fog. I can only see these kind of shapes in the fog. And Clara and the Sun is almost like that. It's an old man <laughs> looking at the future and, and trying to make out these shapes. I'm hoping that the younger writers who will own this age, they will see more clearly our present age and the period that lies in front of us. You will hear a man talking on the radio about a national arts centre. Hello, and welcome to Focus on the Arts. I'm your host, Dave Green, and this is your very own local radio programme. Every Friday evening, we put the spotlight on different arts and culture facilities and look at the shows and events that are on offer in the coming week. And today, the focus is on the National Arts Centre. Now, if you don't already know it yourself, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's famous throughout the world as one of the major venues for classical music. But did you know that it's actually much more than just a place to hear concerts? The centre itself is a huge complex that caters for a great range of arts. Under a single roof it houses concert rooms, theatres, cinemas, art galleries and a wonderful public library, as well as service facilities including three restaurants and a bookshop. So, at any one time, the choice of entertainment there is simply enormous. So, how did they manage to build such a big arts complex right in the heart of the city? Well, the area was completely destroyed by bombs during the war in 1940. So the opportunity was taken to create a cultural centre that would be what they called the city's gift to the nation. Of course, it took a while for such a big project to get started, but it was planned in the 60s, built in the 70s, and eventually opened to the public in 1983. Ever since then, it has proved to be a great success. It's not privately owned, like many art centres, but is still in public hands. It's run by the City Council. Both our National Symphony Orchestra and National Theatre Company were involved in the planning of the project, and they're now based there, giving regular performances every week. And as the centre is open 363 days of the year, there are plenty of performances to choose from. So, to give you some idea of what's on, and to help you choose from the many possibilities, we've made a selection of the star attractions. If you're interested in classical music, then we recommend you go along to the National on either Monday or Tuesday evening at 7.30 for a spectacular production of The Magic Flute, probably the most popular of all Mozart's operas. It's in the Garden Hall, and tickets start at only £8, but you'll have to be early if you want to get them that cheap. And remember, it's only on for those two evenings. For those more interested in the cinema, you might like to see the new Canadian film, which is showing on Wednesday evening at 8pm in Cinema 2. And that's called Three Lives. It's had fantastic reviews, and tickets cost just £4.50, which is a reduction on the usual price of £5.50. So, it's really good value, especially for such a great movie. But you can see the centre's main attraction at the weekend, because on Saturday and Sunday, 
11 a.m. to 10 p.m., they're showing a wonderful new exhibition that hasn't been seen anywhere else in Europe yet. It's a collection of Chinese art called Faces of China. That's in Gallery 1, and it has some really fascinating paintings and sculptures by leading artists from all over China. And the good news is that it's completely free, so don't miss it. So why not go along to the National Arts Centre next week for one or all of these great events? And you can always pick up a programme and check out all the other performances and exhibitions on offer, or coming soon, on almost every day of the year. Next week, we'll be looking at the new Museum of Science. Marcus Aurelius Death is a release from the impressions of the senses, from the desires that make us their puppets, from the vagaries of the mind, and from the hard service of the flesh, wrote Marcus Aurelius in his Meditations. The future Roman emperor was to the manner born, his parents were both members of the ruling patrician class, in Rome on April 26, 121 A.D. As a young man, he was a serious student, devoted to the teachings of the Greek Stoic philosopher Epictetus. Marcus's early life would make a good soap opera. He came to the attention of the Emperor Hadrian, who arranged for him to be adopted by Antoninus, who was next in line to be emperor. Antoninus, who had another adoptive son, known as Varus, succeeded to the throne in 138. Marcus continued his studies, married Antoninus's daughter, Faustina, and served as consul, the leader of the Senate. In 161, Antoninus died and Marcus shared the throne with his adoptive brother until Varus's death in 169, after which Marcus ruled alone. Marcus Aurelius is most remembered for his philosophical meditations, rooted in Stoic philosophy, many of which deal with the meaning of death, characterized as a welcome and natural part of life. Despise not death, but welcome it, for nature wills it like all else, he wrote. Live a good life. If there are gods and they are just, then they will not care how devout you've been, but will welcome you based on the virtues you've lived by. If there are gods, but unjust, then you should not want to worship them. If there are no gods, then you will be gone, but you will have lived a noble life that will live on in the memories of your loved ones. Perhaps his final word on the subject is this wry observation. Death smiles at us all. All we can do is smile back. Marcus Aurelius, smiling or not, met his death in 180, when he was 59, near what is now Vienna. He had been ill for some time with an unknown ailment, possibly cancer, and is thought to have died of an infection. There were tales that he had died of the plague brought back from Parthia by his army, or from lead poisoning in the water pipes, or that his son, Commodius, hastened his departure by administering poison. But these suppositions are all without evidence. Marcus is buried in the Mausoleum of Hadrian at Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome. Sharpen your skills with this next listening session. Listen closely and snag every new word that floats by. Let's master your vocabulary. Unsheathe your inner voice and practice pronouncing each word. Craft a short sentence to acquire its meaning and lock it in your memory. Let's unleash your vocabulary potential. You will hear a university tutor and a new student called Paul discussing Paul's work experience and Latin American studies course. I've been reading your personal statement, Paul. First, let's talk about your work experience in South America. What took you there? Was it to gain more fluency in Spanish? Well, as I'm combining Spanish with Latin American studies, my main idea was to find out more about the way people lived there. My spoken Spanish was already pretty good, in fact. Mm, so you weren't too worried about language barriers? No. In fact, I ended up teaching English there. 
although that wasn't my original choice of work. I see. How did you find out about all this? I found an agency that runs all kinds of voluntary projects in South America. What kind of work? Well, there were several possibilities. You mean construction, engineering work? Yes, getting involved in building projects was an option. Then there was tourism, taking tourists for walks around the volcanoes, which I actually chose to do. And then there was work with local farmers. Mm. But you didn't continue with that project. Why not? Because I never really knew whether I'd be needed or not. I'd thought it might be difficult physically, but I was certainly fit enough. Now, I wanted to do something that had more of a proper structure to it, I suppose. I get demotivated otherwise. What do you think you learned from your experience? It must have been a great opportunity to examine community life. Yes, but it was difficult at first to be accepted by the locals. It was a very remote village, and some of them were reluctant to speak to me, although they were always interested in my clothes and how much I had to pay for them. Well, that's understandable. Yes, but things soon improved. What struck me was that when people became more comfortable with me and less suspicious, we really connected with each other in a meaningful way. You made good friends? Yes, with two of the families in particular. Good. What about management? Did you have a project manager? Yes, and he gave me lots of advice and guidance. And was he good at managing too? That wasn't his strong point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was often more interested in the academic side of things than filing reports. He was a bit of a dreamer. Uh, and did you have a contract? I had to stay for a minimum of three months. My parents were surprised when I asked to stay longer, six months in the end. I was so happy there. And did anything on the administration side of things surprise you? What was the food and lodging like? Simple, but there was plenty to eat and I only paid seven dollars a day for that, which was amazing really. And they gave me all the equipment I needed, even a laptop. You didn't expect that then? No. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more. But now let's look at these modules. You'll need to start thinking about which ones you'll definitely want to study. The first one here is Gender Studies in Latin America. Mm. It looks at how gender analysis is reconfiguring civil society in Latin America. Women are increasingly occupying positions in government and in other elected leadership positions in Latin America. I think you'd find it interesting. If it was to do with people in the villages rather than those in the public sphere, I would. OK. What about second language acquisition? Do you think I'd find that useful? Well, you've had some practical experience in the field. I think it would be. I hadn't thought about that. I'll put that down as a definite, then. OK. What about indigenous women's lives? That sounds appropriate. I thought so, too, but I looked at last year's exam questions and that changed my mind. Uh, don't judge the value of the course on that. Maybe talk to some other students first, and we can talk about it again later. OK. Yes. And lastly, will you sign up for Portuguese lessons? My Spanish is good, so would I find that module easy? Mm, not necessarily. Some people find that Spanish interferes with learning Portuguese, getting the accent right, too. It's quite different in a lot of ways. Well, I'd much sooner do something else, then. All right. Now, what we need to do... International health experts have agreed on a new definition of what it means for a disease to spread through the air. The agreement came after the World Health Organization, WHO, cooperated with hundreds of international health experts to explain or clarify the meaning. The WHO said the technical document it issued was the first step towards finding better methods to better prevent airborne disease spread. The document says the term through the air can be used for infectious diseases in which the main spread involves a pathogen traveling through the air or being suspended in the air. The experts said this is similar to the official description of waterborne diseases. The WHO's new explanation is an effort to avoid public misunderstandings about how some diseases can be passed through the air or are airborne.
Such misunderstandings happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. The WHO was criticized by many scientists during the early days of COVID-19 in 2020. They accused the UN Health Agency of failing to warn the public early on that the virus could spread through the air. The scientists said this led to too much public guidance centered on hand washing and similar measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. They said this guidance ignored other measures such as looking at the spread of viruses through ventilation systems. By July 2020, the agency said there was evidence emerging of airborne spread. Samya Swaminathan was WHO chief scientist during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Swaminathan began a process to agree on a new definition for airborne disease spread. She later said she thinks the agency should have been more forceful in that message much earlier. Swaminathan's successor, Jeremy Farrer, recently told Reuters news agency the new definition was about more than COVID-19. He added that at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lack of available evidence. He said experts, including the WHO, had acted in good faith. At the same time, he headed the Wellcome Trust charity and advised the British government on COVID-19. Farrer said the new definition would permit discussions to begin about issues such as ventilation in different kinds of buildings, including hospitals and schools. He compared the issue to the realization that bloodborne viruses, like HIV or hepatitis B, could be spread by medics not wearing gloves. When I started out, medical students, nurses, doctors, none of us wore gloves to take blood, Farrer said. Now it is unthinkable that you wouldn't wear gloves, but that came because everyone agreed on what the issue was. They agreed on the terminology. The change in practice came later, he added. You will hear a lecture about success in business systems. Good morning, everyone. In the last few lectures, I've been dealing with business finance, but now I'm going to move on to business systems. And in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about what can go wrong when businesses try to copy their own best practices. Once a business has successfully introduced a new process, managing a branch bank, say, or selling a new product, the parent organization naturally wants to repeat that success and capture it, if possible, on a bigger scale. The goal, then, is to utilize existing knowledge and not to generate new knowledge. It's a less glamorous activity than pure innovation, but it actually happens more often, as a matter of fact. However, surprisingly, Getting things right the second time is not necessarily any simpler than it was the first time. Now, there's been a lot of research into how companies can repeat their previous successes, and it certainly hasn't been confined to the United States. It seems that most large industries are trying to repeat their own successes and manage the knowledge they've acquired. But even so... It has been shown that the overwhelming majority of attempts fail. A host of studies confirm this, covering a wide range of business settings. Branch banks, retail stores, real estate agencies, factories, call centers, to name but a few. So why do so few managers get things right the second or third time? 
let's consider one reason for failure. Placing too much trust in the people who are running the successful operation, the experts, shall we say. Managers who want to apply existing knowledge typically start off by going to an expert, such as the person who designed and is running a successful department store and picking their brains. Now, this approach can be used if you want to gain a rough understanding of a particular system or understand smaller, isolated problems. The trouble is, even the expert doesn't fully grasp the whole thing because when it comes to complex systems, the individual components of the process are interwoven with one another. The expert never has complete access to the necessary information. And the situation's complicated even further by the fact that experts are usually not aware of their own ignorance. The ignorance can take various forms. For instance, a lot of details of the system are invisible to managers. Some may be difficult to describe, learned on the job, and well-known by workers, perhaps, but impossible to describe in a way that's helpful. And there are some things that people know or do that they're not even aware of. Now, let's consider two types of mistake that can occur when a manager actually starts to set up a duplicate system to replicate a successful process. Firstly, perhaps he forgets that he was just trying to copy another process and starts trying to improve on it. Another mistake is trying to use the best parts of various different systems in the hope of creating the perfect combination. Unfortunately, Attempts like these usually turn out to be misguided and lead to problems. Why? Well, for various reasons. Perhaps there weren't really any advantages after all, because the information wasn't accurate. Or perhaps the business settings weren't really comparable. More typically, the advantages are real enough but there are also disadvantages that have been overlooked. For example, the modifications might compromise safety in some way. So what's the solution? Well, I don't intend to suggest that it's easy to get things right the second time. It's not. But the underlying problem has more to do with attitudes than the actual difficulty of the task and there are ways of getting it right. These involve adjusting attitudes, first of all. Being more realistic and cautious, really. Secondly, they involve exerting strict controls on the organizational and operational systems. And this, in turn, means copying the original as closely as possible not merely duplicating the physical characteristics of the factory, but also duplicating the skills that the original employees had. Reliance on a template like this offers the huge advantage of built-in consistency. A story about hedonism superficiality and moral emptiness, this late Victorian Gothic novel by the flamboyant Irish playwright Oscar Wilde did not become a classic until after his death in 1900. It champions the appeal of timeless art whose beauty does not die and warns of the dangers of a purely aesthetic life. The protagonist is a man called Dorian Gray, who sells his soul in return for eternal youth. When an artist called Basil Hallward meets Gray, he becomes obsessed by his unblemished beauty. Yes, he was certainly wonderfully handsome, with his finely curved scarlet lips, his frank blue eyes, his crisp gold hair. There was something in his face that made one trust him at once. All the candor of youth was there, as well as all youth's passionate purity. 
One felt that he had kept himself unspotted from the world. No wonder Basil Hallward worshipped him. Hallward paints a perfect portrait of Dorian Gray, who declares that he would trade his soul to keep the beauty he sees in the painting. So begins a life of deceit and secrecy. As Gray loses his innocence, his portrait grows older and more sinister-looking, while Gray himself never ages. He hides the painting so that no one can see the changes, but his appetite for wrongdoing grows stronger. That curiosity about life seemed to increase with gratification. The more he knew, the more he desired to know. He had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them. Dorian Gray becomes involved in terrible things, murder, suicide and debauchery. But he refuses to take any responsibility for his behavior. When Hallward visits him, Gray reveals the much-changed portrait, the face of my soul, as he calls it. Hallward is horrified. It has the eyes of a devil. Each of us has heaven and hell in him, Basil, cried Dorian with a wild gesture of despair. Hallward turned again to the portrait and gazed at it. My God, if it is true, he exclaimed, and this is what you have done with your life. Why, you must be worse even than those who talk against you fancy you to be. When it was published, Victorian England was scandalized by the novel, especially its homoeroticism. Contemporary reviews described it as unclean and poisonous. Five years later, at the height of his theatrical fame, Wilde was convicted of gross indecency for his homosexual relationships. The picture of Dorian Gray was used as evidence against him. The author was a victim of his age and his authenticity. In Wilde's moral fantasy, Dorian Gray's past eventually catches up with him, even as he tries to conceal it. Was he always to be burdened by his past? Was he really to confess? Never. There was only one bit of evidence left against him. The picture itself, that was evidence. He would destroy it. Why had he kept it so long? After two years in prison, Oscar Wilde was released a broken man. He died in exile in Paris, aged 46. He is remembered as a brilliant writer whose plays remain popular to this day. His only novel, Dorian Gray, has been adapted many times for screen. Directed by Albert Lewin, the 1945 film version won two Oscars. Although the book is often used as a study of Victorian morality, the author himself wrote persuasively in the preface, The artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these there is hope. They are the elect to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. We'll see you next time for more exciting and helpful videos to help you master your speaking fluency through our listening sessions. Thank you for being with us.